Welcome once again to self isolation or whatever we want to call it. whatever whatever episode number we're up to. Welcome. Thanks for showing up. I uh, appreciate it. Today we are talking about rock, some rock bass lines. Now I, I grew up playing rock music in like dirty bars and like regional Queensland, which I mean, if you know anything about regional Queensland, you know, it's like there's a lot of there's a lot of rock lovers up there. So I was like playing all this stuff since I was a kid. I was super into like Led Zeppelin and ACDC, like all those classic rock, uh, you know, bands. I was super, super into them. So we're going to talk about how to um, create your own authentic sounding rock bass lines today. And it's not just about rock. Like we're, we are, we'll, we'll be using rock as sort of a vehicle uh, to, you know, you learn the process of creating authentic bass lines and all that kind of thing. Uh, because of course... Rock is going to mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, right? Uh, now, if you guys are here, chances are you may be interested in uh, in rock music. So if you are, in the comments, to the right, or wh whichever side it's on, <laughs> uh, just uh, type in, uh, like, one, whatever your favorite rock bands are, favorite rock songs, uh, and we're going to have, uh, you know, have a look at some real-life examples, you're going to do a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, let me know what you're into, because if, if I can, like, use examples from those people, that'd be awesome. Uh, I mean, if not, it's totally fine as well, though. We've got plenty of examples lined up. Dylan says, Metallica. Yeah, I was super into Metallica when I was, like, uh, like early high school. I, like, just discovered my teenage angst. I was like, ah, rock, all the Metallica stuff. Yeah, I was, I, I totally went through a Metallica phase. Ah, Ben says Toto. Ah, oh, man. Ah, Ben has immaculate taste. Such a good band. Dylan also says Cream. Awesome. Uh, Thomas says U2, Muse, Waterboys, Decemberist, Arcade Fire. Okay, so I got some old stuff, got some new stuff. Very, very cool. Some Thin Lizzy. Awesome. Ah, okay. We've got heaps of stuff to work with today. Okay, that's awesome. So, first, before we even get started playing... Uh, and just let me know if you can hear my bass real quick. If not, just let me know, uh, and I'll you know figure out what the issue might be. Uh, I've got tons of examples coming in now. I've got U2, got Deep Purple, got Rush, Slipknot, and Disturbed, and so more on the metal side of rock. Awesome. Okay, cool. But before we even get into any playing, we need to talk about the purpose of the bass in rock music. Now, what is in your own words, what do you think the purpose of the bass in rock is? I mean, most of the time, uh, unless you're like Cliff Burton in Metallica, like uh, Dylan was saying, uh, there'll be, you know, the bass isn't usually at the front and the center, right? So let us know what you think the purpose of the bass is in rock music. I'm super curious to hear some of your answers, because I, I mean, I've got a certain idea in my head, but it might be different from yours, it might be the same, who knows? Okay, it looks like the bass is working. Awesome. Perfect. Connect the melody with the rhythm. Ah, hey, Nikki. Good to see you on here. That's awesome. Connect the melody with the rhythm. Awesome. Very, very good uh, Good answer. We've got rhythm section is the purpose of rock music. Okay. Mike says hold the bottom. Yeah, I'm liking these answers. These are good, solid, solid answers. Uh, yeah. <laughs> to hold it down and to kill it. Yes, it's, that sounds very aggressive when, when that's taken out of context. I better not... I hope this doesn't end up on YouTube or something. <laughs> uh, Dylan says to hold down a good groove. Yeah, I'd say that's, that's the purpose of bass in... Oh, like 90% of music, for sure. Um, there's, I mean, there's always going to be exceptions, but that's always... If you're, if you're holding down a good groove, then you're doing a good job as a bass player. Uh, Harmonize the melody, Rob says. Also, hey Rob, how's it going? Very, very good answer as well. Yeah, these are all great answers. I'm, I'm super... You guys are... You guys know what you're talking about. I don't know what you need me for. <laughs> um, so, uh, what I love that you guys haven't said is that the bass uh, isn't like the front and center. It's not like the uh, thing that people come to see specifically. Uh, if you're playing maybe funk music, where there's like a funk bass line that's a composition in and of itself, it's like super rhythmic and like you can take everything else away and still be like, damn, that's a good song. Then, you know, that's a good funk bass line will do that. If you're playing like a jazz song where the bass is soloing every like second song or every every song, then, you know, the bass is playing a much different role in that, uh, in that kind of um, scenario, right? And what you guys have said, like uh, holding down the bottom, uh, connect the heart, uh, connect the um, the melody and the rhythm uh, to hold down a good groove. That stuff is all totally, totally, um, totally part of what the bass does in rock music. Uh, and in general, 
this is this is like I'm painting in very broad strokes at the moment. But in general, the purpose of the bass is to make things feel a certain way, right? And so if you're playing a rock bass line, it has to feel a certain way. And usually it needs to feel like big and powerful. and uh, Yeah, because, you know, we're rocking. <laughs> so, uh, okay. This is interesting. Rob says, what I love is so noticeable when the bass isn't there. Exactly. Like, you might not necessarily be like, oh, this, this song has a sick bass line. Uh, people aren't usually going to say that, but when you take the bass away, it's like, oh, what's, what's wrong with this song? This song doesn't feel like the way it should. Yeah, so definitely, definitely uh, part of it there. So um, let's get into some kind of, uh, I, I like to call them umbrellas that you can kind of put these uh, rock bass lines under. Yeah, the ones that make things feel big and powerful, hold down a good groove and all that kind of stuff. One of the, the most uh, common type of rock bass lines is the very humble... Eighth note bass lines, so the ones that go. Yeah, I'm, I, I know you guys have heard these kind of bass lines. Uh, let me know if you've got like a favorite song that uses this kind of bass line. Chuck it in the comments because uh, I'd love to love to you know demonstrate with some of these stuff. Uh, Larry Graham, thank you. Yes, Jerry Tyler. Uh, Larry Graham has, uh, what's the song called? Uh, Everyday People. It's totally a, uh, an eighth note bass line. And all it does is stay, I can't remember what key it's in, but it does exactly that. Eighth notes. Just eighth notes the whole way. And it's a sick song. Check out Everyday, like the original Sly and the Family Stone, Everyday People. It is such a banger, and it's so good. It's so good, and the bass line is so simple. Uh, it's maybe a little bit of a variation because it's not kind of straight the whole way through. The notes aren't always the same. It's like a short, long, short, long. <laughs> Mark says, I was going to say play eighth notes, but didn't want to be hated. No, it's totally a thing. It's absolutely a thing. Dylan says ACDC. Totally. Like, you, you listen to any ACDC uh, song, it's going to, well, not anyone, but like, you know, once again, painting with broad strokes, it's going to be like, uh, what's the song called? Thunderstruck, where the guitars are going, or doing all that stuff. The bass the whole time is just going, just laying it down on that B. Oh yeah, <laughs> Rob even knows exactly how many bars. That's crazy. 63 consecutive bars of B. Yeah, that's all it is. And you know what? It's perfect. It's perfect for that song, because that song needs that. It needs that. It's doing everything we said uh, in the in the first, uh, when I asked you what the purpose of, the, of rock bass is. It's laying down the groove. It's uh, driving things forward. Uh, it's connecting the harmony, uh, sorry, the melody with the rhythm. It's And it's all doing that with just simple eighth note bass line if you want it like that if <laughs> if you're playing a, if you're like writing a rock song and you don't can't think of a bass line chuck an eighth note bass line in there chances are it's not going to sound horrible it's, it's almost never going to sound wrong uh, in like in that rock context uh, and it's like tons of uh, tons of songs use it it's authentic it's authentic because it's in the music already ACDC uh, what are some other other examples um, are we talking about uh, What's that song? I, I can't live with or without you. Like, there's no variation in that song at all, with or without you. The other, other real famous one is um, uh, there's the police one. Every breath you take. Every breath you take. I'm not sure if it's in this key. Every move you make. Every something you take, every something you fake, I don't know the words. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's just eighth notes the whole way. There's going to be small variations, as there always is, uh, but eighth notes, they're going to be a staple of pretty much any uh, any good rock song, yeah? Uh, Billy Idol, yeah, totally, like uh, White Wedding, uh, what's the Rebel, there's a Rebel, yeah. Uh, yeah. In the midnight hour, I stand mom, mom, At the rebel yell, I stand mom, mom, I don't actually know, uh, I've never actually played that song, but yeah, it's totally eighth notes the whole way through. And it works, it works perfectly. 
Okay, so that's umbrella number one. It's gonna work pretty much all the time. Uh, umbrella number two isn't quite as common. It's probably more common uh, in the uh, kind of uh, funk songs and ones that are, you know, a bit slower, usually don't need quite as much drive, but it's uh, the same thing, but just with quarter notes. So if, do you guys know any bass lines in a rock sense that use just quarter notes? So one, two, three, four. Any, uh, any songs you can think of that use just a quarter note based bass line. And also like, we're talking about rock music, but like that, you know, means a whole bunch of different things to a whole bunch of different people. So like what uh, someone might call, uh, like a younger person might call something rock now, you know, an old, older person might call it pop or whatever it is. Ah, um, oh, this is interesting. This, I didn't know this. John says, every breath you take has three bases overlaid on the track. There's an upright, a P bass and a fretless. I did not know that. I just, I, all I've ever heard was the, the kind of eighth notes. So that's interesting. Yeah. Ah, okay, here's a good one. Longview, uh, the Green Day song. I can't remember what key it's in. Dun, 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 dun. Uh, yeah, that. Yeah, okay, so this one, I, I had to remember how to play it. <laughs> All right, so this, this bass line goes like this. I'll just get rid of this real quick. Yeah, so... It's got a couple little skips in there, like a dum da 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 bugger. So it's got a couple little things in there. So it's not not quarter notes the whole way through, but absolutely, this is like a a, a quarter note based uh, bass line that just works the whole way through. And it's got the and this one's actually uh, kind of falls into another umbrella, which we'll talk about in a little bit for sure. Uh, okay, we've got heaps of them. We've got. Uh, uh, running with the Devil, we've got Sheep, we got Ace of DC's The Jack, Sweet Child of Mine, Intra, ah, that's, yeah. I haven't played that in years. Yeah, that's, oh man, that's beautiful. I should, I should talk about that, because that's really cool. Uh, and other ones that are, that are off the top of my head would be uh, like uh, Superstition. It's like a ah. Oh, we see like my bass tones a little bit muted. Uh, I'm just I'm actually just uh, muting with my hands doing doing these kind of ones. But verses. So muted, unmuted. If I exaggerate, yeah, all those ones. Uh, Steve says Psycho Killer from uh, uh, Talking Heads. Totally time. Uh, that is time now. Freaking away. Yeah, totally. That's totally one of those, like, it's just quarter notes the whole way through, or at least most of the way through, that's kind of forming the basis of the song, and it works really well. It does the same thing. It connects the uh, rhythm with the melody, supports the harmony, does all that kind of stuff. <laughs> uh, Paul asks, what are we suggesting? I just joined. Uh, right, right now we're talking about quarter note based uh, bass lines in rock music. We just talked about a bunch of them. Uh, but we're actually going to move on right now to umbrella number three. Uh, and this is, uh, this is, again, these are, these aren't kind of hard barriers. It's not like we've got these kind of bass lines and then these kind of bass lines and then these kind of bass lines. It's not like that. It's very, very fluid. So the third, uh, third kind of umbrella you can kind of fall into is, uh, bass lines that follow the bass drum. Yeah. So, uh, you know, this is going to be a ton. This is, isn't just rock music, by the way, this is tons of music. This is like a bunch of country music, uh, folk music. Uh, jazz music in some instances, you know, there's tons of places where the bass is going to be following the bass drum pretty much uh, directly. Uh, some, uh, we're going to, we're going to get to, we're going to get to this Dylan for sure. Uh, but right now, uh, hit me with some bass lines that you know that uh, follow the bass drum, if not completely, then, you know, roughly pretty much all the time. Ones that are, uh, yeah, bass drum is the kick drum. Yeah, sorry, kick drum. The ones that goes, mm, mm, ka, mm, 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 ka, that one. Uh, around the world, Daft Punk. Uh, yeah, that's like a um, that's a, a, a quarter note. But yeah, okay. this is this is a really good uh, example of ones that kind of cross over. So I said the umbrellas aren't kind of hard baskets. It's not kind of like that. This is one where it's uh, it's definitely the kick drum in Around the World is playing quarter notes. And what does the bass line do? It plays quarter notes. So this is one where the kind of umbrellas they're very close together. So there's definitely some overlap there. Totally. Uh, Dylan says another one bites the dust. Totally. 
It's that that whole uh, three on E thing. One, two, three. Ah. Uh. And of course, there's a little bit of variation there, but those first three hits. Uh, 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 uh. Yeah, we're gonna. Uh, this is gonna be. I don't think the bass drum plays. Ba -boom, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> I can't remember exactly what it plays, but it plays something very similar. Uh, 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 t ba -boom, t something like that. Whatever it is. But yeah, that's a very good example. Uh, I don't know uh, Zombie's time of the season. Uh, Rosanna. Yeah, totally. Oh, that's such a good example. Boom. I don't actually, I've never actually played Rosanna, but man, that is a... Yeah, ben was saying about Toto before. Totally, totally. Um, Folsom Prison Blues. Yeah, this is another one where we're, we're getting a bass drum playing along with the... Uh, sorry, bass playing along with the kick drum, doing the... It's coming round the bend. When the kick drum's going... Mm, mm, mm. Mm. It's like a classic country thing, but like, again, we're using like rock as in very, very broad terms. You know, Johnny Cash, maybe a little bit more country, but you know, it's all good. It's all good. So those are our first three umbrellas, playing uh, straight quarter notes, playing eighth notes and ones that follow the bass drum. Another one that comes to mind for me uh, is one that I play far too much at gigs is... Uh... <laughs> Uh, what's it called? Hey, hey, we, uh, uh, brown eyed girl. Yeah. Of course, there's a little bit of little extra bits in there. So the kick drum's going. But anytime there's a, a really strong uh, kick drum, it's very strong bass drum. Then we've got. Mm, bass to go along with it. it makes everything feel nice and full nice and round nice and fat it's going to connect like i said all the things we've been saying so far connecting the melody with the harmony and the rhythm doing all that kind of stuff uh yeah and flea would use a lot of syncopation playing around the drummer uh yeah once you get into uh, more busy stuff it comes it becomes very hard to you know kick play the play with the kick drum at every single time the bass player plays a note and if you did that it'd sound horrible it'd just be like and it wouldn't wouldn't work so well, um, but yeah, it's 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 totally a thing. Okay, uh, now this is something that we uh, I think it was Dylan brought it up before, uh, and that's uh, lines that you play in unison with another instrument. Now this is usually in rock music. It's going to be uh, the guitar. If you're playing, you know, a riff in unison with someone, it's, gonna, it's usually going to be a guitar. It doesn't always have to be. It has to be. It could be a keyboard. It could be a banjo, it could be a mandolin, it could be an accordion, who knows, could be whatever. Uh, but let me know your favorite ones are of uh, favorite bass lines that are doubled in another instrument. You're playing in unison with another instrument. Uh, so someone mentioned Cream before, I can't, was it also Dylan? I can't remember. But uh, songs like... The, I mean, the guitarist is playing... That's totally, uh, totally in unison with uh, the bass and the guitar. Uh, Dylan says Master of Puppets. Yeah, that's a, if anyone doesn't know, it's a Metallica song and album. Pretty much, <laughs> I, won't, I won't say all because that's, you know, I can't speak in that big of terms, but tons of uh, uh, metal stuff, especially Metallica, the bass is playing uh, very similar, if not the exact same thing as the guitar because it wants to feel big. It wants to feel really, you know, thick and all that stuff. Uh, Orion? Yeah, definitely. There's definitely parts in that where that song, where there's the bass and the guitar are playing the exact same thing. And of course, there's places where it's not. You know, it's always, it's always, uh, you know, here or there. Uh, has anyone mentioned Rush? Not yet, but uh, Rush and Chris Sp Squire specifically, there's going to be, I'm going to talk about them, uh, that, those kind of bass lines in a little bit. Uh, Denny says, hey, Joe. Yeah, totally. The... That whole uh, that whole section of the song, man, what a what a good song. Let me just get rid of this. That whole thing. And that's also, by the way, doubles as an eighth note bass line. So we're getting crossover from umbrella 
what was it, Umbrella 1 from Umbrella 4, all that kind of stuff. So, like I said, this <laughs> these are never like hard borders. These aren't like, uh, you know, like we've got right, right now, like closed borders. No, there's like free movement between all five of the umbrellas. Totally, totally. Uh, Mike says I harmonize with the left-handed keyboard. Yeah, totally. Uh, doing all that stuff and like playing with uh, the left hand of a keyboard, totally a thing. Uh, it gets a little bit annoying if it's like a like an organ or something that sounds really thick. You're like, ah, oh, that's my sonic space. Get out of there. <laughs> uh, there's a couple of songs in here I don't know. I don't know uh, Holiday in Cambodia by the Dead Kennedys. Uh, Green Day, yeah, totally. They play a guitar and bass, playing the same thing all the time. Happens super, super common. Uh, Dylan also says Iron Maiden. Yeah, any 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 of those uh, old school uh, metal bands, and even a lot of the new school metal bands, they'll do the exact same thing. They'll have, uh, yeah, this is a great example. The 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 trooper. Oh, wait, is that the trooper? Yeah, that's the trooper. Uh, yeah, it's like doing the the whole uh, Steve Harris gallop thing. That's totally a vibe. Once again, getting one instrument, doubling it in another, makes it feel really really big. Yeah. Okay, we're getting tons of uh, examples now. Yeah, doubling that in the guitar. or I mean, I say doubling. Uh, they're just playing in unison. People get, sometimes they get like a little bit emotional. Like, oh, the bass isn't doubling the guitar. The guitar's doubling the bass. I'm like, uh, it's the same, the same result. I don't, I don't care who's copying who. As long as they're playing the same thing at the same time. That's the thing that matters. <laughs> Uh, okay, so that's uh, number one, two, three, and four. We've got uh, like straight eighth notes, quarter notes, following the bass drum. We've got uh, unison in uh, with another instrument. Uh, the final uh, kind of umbrella, and this is a very, very big umbrella, is uh, uh, bass lines in rock music that are completely independent of anything else. They're not playing kind of straight eighth notes. They're not playing quarters or just following the bass drums. They're not playing something in unison with another uh, instrument. They're playing a completely independent melodic line. Yeah, so if you can think of bass lines like that, and there are tons of them, so many good bass lines are like this. Dro drop them in whatever side you can, or maybe it's down there for you. I'm not sure, whatever you're watching on. Uh, uh, ah, Dylan also said, I'm not sure if this is about uh, the this umbrella or the previous umbrella, but uh, Muse does this a lot. Yeah, they, um, they have sections where they have completely independent melodic bass lines, but they also have times when it's like playing the same thing at the same time. Uh, yeah, Weasty. In for the kill. What a good bass line. This is like one of my favorite. I, I actually put this in a video uh, called like the three melodic, most melodic bass lines of all time. And this is like, this is probably my number one, to be honest. Ah, it's so good. And it's, uh, in case you don't know, it sounds like this. One, two, three, four. Ah, oh, man. That's like a whole composition in and of itself and no one else is playing that line the in the in case you don't know the recording uh i mean check it out it's a it's a total banger uh but it's like an acoustic guitar is uh playing chords uh at the start i don't think there's any drums in there at the start but it's definitely if there is it's definitely not playing a bass drum on that rhythm i think there's like a shaker or something uh and it's like ah, it's so so good uh dazed and confused yeah another another john paul jones line totally to uh Totally. At the very start, when the, the bass is playing that just by itself, a completely independent melodic bass line. Of course, uh, I think when it gets to the chorus, the guitar actually comes in and plays that line with the, the bass. And that and at that point, it becomes, you know, we're shifting from umbrella, what were we at, five to umbrella four. So it's like playing something with another instrument. But yeah, totally, totally, totally. Uh, now, yeah, let's see. Ah, yes, Chris. Chris oh, whoops, wrong one. Where'd it go? Someone was saying, just naming a bunch of different. Someone said like Chris Squire. Ah, uh, oh, where'd it go? Ah, anyway, yeah, uh, Chris Squire, Geddy Lee, and then someone, some an another one that I've I've lost it now. Yeah, sorry, but yeah, like these are all bass line bass players. Sorry, that have like very individual styles. They're playing melodic stuff all the time. Uh, well, not all the time. There's always going to be times when, you know, it's going to be like, just kind of comes down to like an eighth note or a quarter note, or maybe it's like playing in unison uh, with something else. Uh, yeah, totally. We've got a, a, lot, a lot of people uh, 
Yeah, we've got lots of Red Hot Chili Peppers. Yeah, totally. Like, Flea does tons of, like, independent stuff uh, that's, you know, far too busy for a bass drum to, like, do a thing. Uh, you know, but there's also times when he will do exactly that. Like, uh, what's a good example? Uh, uh, what's that called? Other Side. The... I love, I love... All that stuff. Yeah, it's he's like going back from you know being super crazy, super inventive, super melodic to being more of a supporting role, and that's like for the song. Uh, yeah, the slap flea, the slap flea bass lines are totally independent. They're totally uh, melodic most of the time. There's uh, uh, times where it's not as well. Uh, so someone mentioned uh, "Can't Stop." That one's actually uh, the guitar line actually starts that off, and then the the bass joins in later. The... <laughs> And then it changes a little bit there as well. I can't remember exactly how it goes, but yeah, it's, uh, yeah. So Weasty's saying, yeah, there's, uh, Can't Stop is coupled with a guitar a lot of the time. Not the whole time, uh, but a lot of the time for sure. So those are our five umbrellas. We've got uh, the eighth notes, the chord notes, following the bass drum. Uh, we've got, uh, what was the other one? Uh, you're playing uh, in unison with another instrument or doubling. Uh, and then we've got, uh, yeah, the guitar restraining Aldrich says. <laughs> yeah, totally. And then we've got completely uh, independent bass lines as well. Now, there are going to be, like I said, there's going to be tons of places where, you know, you'll have a bass line that kind of fits into, you know, Umbrella 4, but, you know, it's also kind of Umbrella 2. There's going to be tons of cross-pollination, and that's that's totally fine. That's, like, normal. Uh, if, if you only ever stuck to one thing at the whole time, it's going to be super, super boring. So the question then becomes, how do you use this information to make your own authentic bass lines? Uh, well, the first thing, uh, first thing I'd really like to stress is that uh, if you want to you know, sound authentic when you do whatever you're going to do, uh, you can't... <laughs> Weasley says the live stream is uh, far superior to many of my Zoom calls. I, I appreciate that. It's really nice. <laughs> uh, but the, if you're, yeah, you're going to make your own authentic bass lines, one thing that you actually absolutely have to do is actually go and learn authentic bass lines. Like, if you want to make lines that sound authentic, you have to know how the authentic stuff sounds. It's like uh, if you went to a chef and like, make me an authentic uh, uh, spaghetti, fettuccine carbonara, and you've only ever seen a fettuccine carbonara, and you never actually tasted it, uh, you've never actually seen anyone else make it, then the chances of you making something that resembles fettuccine carbonara, it's going to be pretty low, right? Uh, like, like, I mean, it's going to be, like, you could go to the shops and, like, you know, chuck in a, a can of, you know, Alfredo sauce or whatever it is that you do. But to, like, make it from scratch, it's going to be virtually impossible, right? If you had no knowledge of, uh, you know, how that was made. And, you know, most of us, we know what fettuccine carbonara is. But if you, like, went to, I don't know, some place where you've never tasted the food and you just looked at it, and you're like, okay, now I want you to make that. And you had no uh, idea of what the ingredients were, how it was made, then there's no way you're going to be able to replicate that yourself, right? It's the same with bass lines. Uh, if you don't know how the authentic bass lines sound, how they relate to everything within the song, what they do for the song, does it make it sound big and fat? Does it make it sound slinky and laid back? Is it pushing forward a little bit? Is it rhythmically just, just on the edge? These are things that you need to know uh, about the original authentic bass lines if you're going to create your own. Uh, and that's... Uh, I mean, you could sum this all up basically in uh, one sentence, and that's don't learn in a vacuum. There's this idea, uh, especially with uh, you know people who think they're artists and like, I have to have pure art and you know, all, all that kind of stuff. And they get this idea that in order to uh, be like original and do all that kind of stuff, then they can't listen to, you know, anyone else's music and they have to do something that's original and blah, blah, blah. But I would... I would argue that that's uh, you know the a pretty bad way of doing things because first of all no one is uh, no one's creating art completely independently everyone's kind of building on what came before and if you have a really good grasp of what's come before then you can create something new and fresh on top of that you've got to have that foundation first and then build on top of that and by the way this isn't just about rock music this is about any style of music you're playing whether you're playing funk or klezmer or gypsy jazz or whatever it is you're playing if you have that strong foundation then you can build on the top of that that's you're going to be in prime position but you can't learn in a vacuum uh, now uh, if we applied this 
this uh, this kind of philosophy to playing rock music. You would just learn a whole bunch of rock bass lines, and then when it came time to create your own, you could pull from your influences. Obviously, if you're like enjoying music, which I'm sure you do, you wouldn't be here if you weren't into music. Like, I love music. I wouldn't be here if I wasn't into music. So I know you are as well. You're going to find stuff that you love. So for me, uh, at the very start, it was stuff like Led Zeppelin. And then I was I went through my like Metallica phase. Then I, I discovered Motown and I started playing jazz. And like I went through this whole thing. At every step, I'm going to find influences, stuff that I really, really love, stuff that I'll just listen to over and over and over again and really kind of embed it in my kind of uh, soul, in my psyche, whatever you want to call it. Uh, <laughs> ben C says he must have been getting hungry when I was talking about all that pasta. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm getting off, off topic a little bit. But if you were going to do this, you would you know, find influences, you would build upon those, you'd take little ideas from them, and then make them your own. So for example, uh, I, I was in like a high school band when I was growing up, and we, we, were, we were pretty bad, you know, we were in high school. No one, no one was really knew what we were doing, but we were super into Pink Floyd, into Led Zeppelin, and into like some more modern stuff as well. I, I got into like Muse, but I like wrote this song that was like a total, um, I mean, it's like very stereotypically rock. I still remember how it was. It goes like this. That was the verse. It was just B, A, G sharp, and A. Uh, but we made a whole song out of it. It was really cool. And then the chorus went... Well, yeah, that's right. It was like the, the lead guitar part. Oh man, I was super into it. Uh, but you know, it was it was totally taking inspiration from all the all the guys that I loved before. Uh, taking inspiration from a lot of the Metallica stuff because it was just like. Or even, uh, you know, the Muse stuff and the, the uh, melodic lines were taken more from, you know, the older kind of classic rock stuff. But I just took all this information and kind of bundled it into uh, my own kind of thing. Uh, and it kind of came out. It's not something that you... I mean, some people, I'm sure, like it's like very contrived. And like, oh, I'll take this section and then put this here and blah, blah, blah. But in general, it's going to be way more uh, organic in that sense. Ah, uh, yeah. Christopher Long says, the amateur borrows the professional steals. <laughs> totally, totally. Uh, oh, okay, this is this is really interesting. Uh, e Dover 60, reggae is my jam, that's what I want to learn. Okay, perfect. If you want to learn uh, how to play authentic reggae bass lines, you'd follow the same process. You'd find, you might go to, you know, uh, you know, go to Spotify and just type in like a reggae playlist and find stuff that you love. Go to that artist, check out entire albums. You'll find like maybe three or four songs that you just love. And so then go through and learn the bass lines from those songs. You don't have to learn like an entire album. You don't have to be super hardcore. If you do want to be super hardcore, by all means, go for it. Learn an entire album from start to finish. That would be an incredible, incredible uh, exercise for you. And if you're if you want to play authentic uh, bass lines in that style, there's like no better way of doing that. So, uh, for example, if you want to learn walking bass lines, you could take the whole of like Miles Davis's Kind of Blue, learn every walking bass line from that album. You're gonna learn tons of stuff. Uh, and then it's going to come out in your own playing when it comes time to make your own uh, bass lines. So like I said, this isn't just about rock. It's not just about rock. It's about every kind of style uh, of music. Uh, now, Aldrich asks, can I have, pardon me, can I have uh, an idea of uh, play a whole song with bass? Uh, I'm, not, I, I'm not super sure if you're asking for like song ideas to play uh, on bass as like a solo uh, thing. Uh, if that's the case, uh, what would be a good example? I've, actually, I've got a lesson on how to make solo pieces on bass. It's very, very old. You'd have to go back to like, oh, like 2014, 2015. I think it's just called how to make solo pieces on your bass. I'll grab, a, I'll see if I can grab a link and ch chuck it in the in the comments. Uh, but that's uh, if that's if that's what you're asking, check out that video. Uh, door slammed, Wendy, uh, and then check out that video and see what you can do. There's going to be, t I think, in that particular video, I used. Um, I said, feel the green red roses too. What a wonderful world. Uh, I can't remember what kid it in. Whatever it was.
was. But yeah, I like made a a, a solo piece out of that. It wasn't a rock thing, but you know, it still works. <laughs> Aiden says uh, the quarantine beard makes you look either homeless or like a billionaire who's shipwrecked on an island for three years. I'll take shipwrecked. Thank you. <laughs> shipwrecked for two hundred, please, Alex. Uh, I, I appreciate that. I'm, I yeah, I'm looking 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 good with the beard. Uh, let's see. Uh, ben says use jam tracks. Yeah, totally. If you've got a if you want to learn how to kind of create on the fly, jam tracks are like a really good uh, place for that. Uh, just try and chuck it on and create from there. Very, very good exercise if you're wanting to learn how to create and do all that kind of stuff. Uh, now, uh, if, if you guys have any specific questions about uh, rock music or learning specific styles or anything like that, dump them in the comments. Uh, if you have other, other questions as well, I'd love to, to answer them as well. Uh, let's go for about 10 more minutes because I don't want to take up too much of you guys' time because I know it's very, 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 very valuable. Can't talk today. Uh, <laughs> uh, Nikki asks, is, "Is super chat turned off?" Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't think I have super chat. I'm not super sure what that is. Uh, but no need to tip. It's all good. It's all. It's all fine. <laughs> uh, now, uh, yeah, let me know about your questions. I'm happy to answer them. Uh, as always, like it can be about bass. It can be about other stuff. Uh, I can tell you my recipe for uh, making pasta. Actually, I I made some pasta by hand the other day. It was awesome. It was super super fun. Uh, it didn't have a pasta roll, so we just had to use a rolling pin. But yeah, it worked. It worked really well. Turns out you don't actually need it. I was I was a bit worried. But w one mistake we did make is we made the pasta just a little bit too little bit too thick. So then when it like we've cooked it, it expanded even more, and then there were like really really thick boys in there for sure. <laughs> uh, ah, okay. Dylan says I have problems soloing over chord changes. Okay, this is a really really good question. This is a very, very big question as well. Uh, if you're soloing over changes, the uh, one of the best things you can possibly do is, uh, well, it's a process. Let me show you the process. I'll just hide your question, but just remember we're talking about uh, soloing over chord changes. So let's say your chord change, uh, your chord progression was something like, uh, let's go 1, 6, 2, 5 in C. So C major 7, let's go A7, D minor 7, G7. The first thing to do in any situation like this where you have to solo over changes is start from the very, very bottom. Start with just playing roots. And then do it all over the bass. So not just in one position, but find all the, all the places where you can do that. You can use the same shape up the octave, up here as well, up here as well. Uh, up here is, oh, can I get that high? Uh, that sucks. <laughs> Super up high. And just start with the roots, getting familiar with every single root on every single place uh, on your bass. Uh, and also not just thinking in terms of shapes, but also thinking in terms of the actual notes. So instead of just using the shape, you might go C, A, D, G. So not completely, it's like completely uh, out of position. You'd never ever play it like that as uh, like in a real world situation. But as an exercise, moving around your bass and getting really good at finding, okay, that's my blah, 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 that's my blah, 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 that's my blah, blah, that's my blah, blah, blah. That's super, super helpful. The next step is to start arpeggiating the chords. So instead of just playing C, A, D, G, play the entire chord. So C, E, G, B, A, C sharp, E, G, D, F, A, C, G, B, D, F. And that's all just in root position as well. The next step is to kind of move away from those as well. So rather than just being like burr, 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 like we've done before, you might go. All that kind of stuff. Uh, and finding all the arpeggios all over your bass as well. So all the C major 7 arpeggios. And are there different ways to play them as well? So rather than just playing the this one, you can play this one. You might play uh, this one. All that kind of stuff. Getting really good at knowing uh, your arpeggios. And if you can as well, sing as you do this. Uh, because it's one thing to know where everything is on the bass. It's an entirely different thing to be able to hear your way through different changes. Uh, and if you can do this with like an iReal Pro or like if you've got a backing track for whatever song you're working on, that's perfect. Uh, then you can just chuck in the chord changes and just be on your way. You don't have to worry about, uh, you know, anything like that. So that, that's like the next step. 
the step beyond that, uh, which really gets to um, the soloing, soloing over changes kind of aspect, because you don't want to just be playing arpeggios the whole time. That's going to be super boring. It's going to be boring for you. It's going to be boring for everyone listening. So don't do that. Uh, do it as an exercise. And then, you know, it's the, that whole thing of learn the rules first, then forget them. Uh, the next step is to figure out where the melodic opportunities are within that chord progression. And the way to do that is with something called guide tones, like I'm a guide, like G-U-I-D-E. And those are generally the seventh and the third of each chord. So uh, in the case of C major, our seventh and our third are B and E. So in you know to do this exercise, you start on, you know, pick one, the seventh or the third, either way, it's all good. So if we start on the seventh and go to the next chord, our next chord is an A7 chord. Ideally, we want to go to a note that's uh, a seventh or a third of this chord as well, but we want the closest one to that note. So in this case, we're going from a B over the C major seven, just one tone up is the C sharp that's part of the A7 chord. So this guide tone line is going to sound like this. Da, da. So we have the bass notes. Da, da. It's going to sound weird with just those, but it'll get it'll make more sense in, in a second. Uh, so that's our next one. Our next chord is a D minor seven, and if you look at our seventh of the chord, the C right there is only one half step away from the C sharp. So our guide tone line is going to be B, C sharp, C, and then when we go to the G seven chord. We're going to go to the B again. So we're going to have... That's our guide tone line. And from there, you can uh, build melodies and ideas that outline those, uh, those guide tones, right? So you might go one, two, three, four... So every time we're going da, da, at the chord change, we're going da, ba, 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 ba. We're using that as kind of the, our anchor to kind of get through those chord changes. And this is a, this is a process that's going to take a long time uh, if you're like at the very start and don't know your arpeggios, your fretboard and all that kind of stuff. So I would <laughs> I would say that this isn't just like a, a something you kind of throw together in an afternoon. But like I said, I, as I always say, it's everything's a skill. It's not it's just a matter of practicing the right things in the right way uh, and doing all that kind of stuff. Uh, now Sean says, show us your favorite go-to fill. One of my favorite fills of all time, I actually made a video on uh, maybe four months ago. It's from... Um, uh, Oh, well, December 63. Uh, I'm terrible with song names today. That's terrible. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, Frankie Valley Four Seasons. Uh, we get uh, this. And then the fill goes, over, it goes like this. And like I said, I did make a make a whole lesson on it, so check that one out. It's like uh, I think it's called uh, like the best fill, bass fill of all time, or something, something bombastic, something to get you to click on the video. <laughs> okay, next question. Uh, Weesty asks, if you were to cover a rock song, do you think it matters to try to follow the original bass line, or can you sort of write your own bass line and the song would still sound okay? Uh, this is depends on the song. Uh, if uh, if it's like a very iconic song, iconic bass line, then you probably want to stick pretty closely uh, to the bass line, or at least the parts that are very iconic. So, for example, if you um, if you wanted to play uh, "Come Together," uh, and you wanted to modify that bass line. I mean, you're more than welcome. To, I've played tons of uh, different versions that come together where it doesn't sound like the Beatles version. But if, you're, if you are trying to sound like the Beatles version, then you probably need to sound like the Beatles version. Uh, if you want to, you know, there's tons of different covers of this song as well that don't play exactly that line. They like put more of a heavy backbeat, make it more of a funk thing. That's totally fine. Uh, so it really depends on the context. If you're playing, if you're like playing a Beatles tribute, then learn that thing. Super, super well. Don't don't skip out on like the, the genius of Paul McCartney. Uh, but you know, if you're playing uh, at like a jam session, it matters a whole lot less. 
uh, yeah, so this is very, very context dependent. Uh, but you know, if, and it also depends on like, if you've got time to learn a whole thing. So like, for example, if you're playing like a, a Motown tribute, uh, and you, uh, like had a song that had tons of like James James, cause he like played everything different the whole time. It was like amazing. Uh, and if you want to like catch all those different little variations and that's going to take a lot of time and a lot of work. Uh, so in that case, it might be, it might make a bit more sense to kind of simplify a little bit and really focus on the bits that, you know, are very, very iconic, uh, that really shouldn't be changed. Uh, I think this is supposed to be Greg228. Are you in a band at the moment? No, none, no one's playing anywhere. I had like, uh, I don't know, a bunch of gigs canceled, uh, in the last, you know, however long, but it's totally fine. Like when things get back to normal, I'll go back to doing the freelance thing. Uh, am I in a specific band myself? Uh, I mean, I play for a lot of different artists. Like I play for some originals artists. Uh, I play with like a lot of different corporate groups where they like, they'll just put bands together and like play events or weddings and all that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, at the moment I'm not really playing with anyone, which sucks. Uh, really sucks. Uh, but you know, when things get back to normal, I'll, you know, I'll get back to playing with people. It'll be good. Uh, okay, we've got some more. Uh, where are we at? Oh, I've, I've lost all my questions. Where'd they go? Uh, let's see. Ah, okay. Is there a software you use to isolate bass tracks in songs you're trying to learn? Yeah, I, I use um, a software called Transcribe. It's the best. Uh, and uh, it's the, I think you get like a 30-day trial if you go to... Um, oh, who makes it? Set, oh, hold on. Uh, uh, Yeah, I think I can get a link for you, because I, I I use this myself. It's like the best. I've, I've actually actually I've, yeah, I'll I'll dump this in the comments. Is this is that the right lesson? Yeah. Okay. So this one right here, I just put in the comments right there. It's like how to how to hear baseline. Uh, and the first three things are like, you know, things that hopefully you <laughs> are common sense. Things like you know, use headphones, don't use computer speakers, like do all that stuff. But about halfway through the lesson, I like go through. Uh, transcribe and like how I use it to um, isolate bass lines and make it so much easier for them to be heard. Um, yeah, so if you, if uh, there's other other programs that do like a similar thing, uh, like uh, Audacity is like another one, but I don't really like Audacity as much. Like Transcribe is like specifically for musicians. It's like it's the best thing that I've ever ever used for it. Now, like, I've, yeah, it's it's good. Um, now let's see. Uh, yeah, Aiden says uh, if I want to support him, I do have classes on the website. Yeah, if uh, like once again though, no no pressure to join or anything like that's just for the people who are like super into it. Ah, oh, Arnie, welcome. Here he is. Decided to make an appearance. <laughs> hey, Puff. Uh, he's just looking at me. <laughs> uh, okay, a uh, Aldrich says uh, what can we do to our tone and our amp if our bass cannot be heard uh, regularly in music, specifically in rock and metal. Um, yeah, this sucks. Because rock guitarists and rock drummers, they love to play loud and they love to take up as much sonic space as humanly possible. It's really funny as well because if you get them into a studio and an engineer's like, okay, we're going to take off most of this bass. They're like, that's where my tone is, dude. You can't take away that. And it's like, oh, it's not going to work. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's tricky. You have to try and find a space within the kind of sonic spectrum. So for example, if the bass drum uh, is like taking up all the super lows and then and you don't really have any space there, then you can, what you can do is kind of uh, take some low, low end out. It's going to sound counterintuitive. Take some low end out and add some mids, uh, maybe in the, in the low mids or even just the regular mids uh, to make yourself heard, uh, just to get some clarity in the sound and, you know, not try and fight uh, the other frequencies uh, in the kick drum. The kick drum especially, that's like the worst one, uh, especially like uh, rock and metal drummers. They love to have like a huge fat kick drum that's like super, super thumpy. Uh, and it can work sometimes. Sometimes, yeah, it just buries the bass and it sucks. So you have to have to kind of shift uh, from where you normally sit to like a little bit higher in the spectrum uh, by, you know, taking out some low end, adding some mids. Good question though. Really good question. Uh, okay, guitar player transitioning to bass. Welcome to the bass playing world, by the way. How do I stop trying to play too many notes uh, using a Barker stand-up bass? I'm not sure if, that, if the using the, the, the stand-up bass is part of the question. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on the how do I stop trying to play too many notes. That's a, that's a super common thing with guitarists. Guitarists love to play tons of notes. Uh, what I'd recommend is uh, rather than putting all the focus on yourself, uh, share some of that focus around. So like, for example, hear what the, the kick drum is doing. If, is the kick drum playing something specific and like repetitive? If they are, jump on that. 
So take take like at the moment it sounds like you've got both ears kind of focused on yourself because you know you're playing too many notes, right? You know it, uh, and other people might as well. They might have their ears in on themselves. They might have their ears out. Uh, but I want you I want you to take one. Oh, obviously you always got to listen to yourself and make sure you're playing well and doing all that stuff. So keep one ear for yourself, and give one ear to everyone else around you, uh, the other other guitarists or keys players. Uh, drummers, drummers especially, because you know you're trying to play as one kind of uh, as one instrument. So if you can direct your focus towards the drummer and do things like that, that's going to be uh, it's going to it's going to solve some problems because you're going <laughs> to you're going to focus on something other than yourself. So you'll be like, okay, I'm playing less notes, which is good, and then you're also going to you know form a deeper connection with everyone else playing around you as well. Good question though, I, I like that one. Thanks, Charles. Uh, let's see. Uh, ah, this is interesting. How do you not buzz when you're in super low tuning? For example, Wait and Bleed by Slipknot. There's a couple of things you can do for this. Uh, number one is get uh, higher gauge strings. Uh, the the well, Higher or lower? Hold on. I need to, <laughs> need to think about this. Physics is not my strong suit. So if they're lighter, then they have to be looser. Yeah, so you want heavier strings so they can be more, uh, they can have more tension and they're going to buzz less. Hopefully that's the, the kind of theory. The other thing you can do is uh, take your bass to a, uh, someone who knows what they're doing and get them to set it up in a way. Just like tell them exactly like, hey, I'm playing uh, like these Slipknot tunes and my bass is buzzing and like all these places. Can you set it up in a way that's gonna, you know, not buzz and do all that stuff? Uh, yeah, so that's that's totally totally a good question. Um, Rob asks, do you have this in a lesson? Uh, are we talking about the guide tone stuff? Uh, if so, no, but that sounds like a good idea. I should, I should totally do that. Uh, all right, let's see. Uh... <laughs> Love to get new guitarists becoming a bassist. Yes, we love to play less notes. <laughs> totally. Uh, all right. Uh, okay, this is a good question. question. How do you get your D and G string to be the same volume as the E string? Uh, now, this could be either one of two things. It could be that your technique is funky, uh, and but not in the good kind of funky. Not in the funky, like the F-O-N-K-Y. It's just like regular funky, which is not good. Like that's, That smells a bit funky. Um, so it could be a technique issue, or it could be a uh, like some issue with your actual bass. So, for example... Um, it could be that your your pickups are uh, higher on one side than the other, so they're getting more volume, uh, which could be part of the problem. Uh, or it could be your technique. You're just like uh, yanking too hard on the E string. Uh, yeah, I think that's pretty... I mean... I've never, I've never consciously thought about the volume on each particular string, which makes me think that uh, it's... Most likely, I don't know, I, I don't want to say like absolutely this or absolutely that. It could be a number of things, but it, it sounds like it could be like a setup issue. Um, yeah, so see if you can get that, that fixed. Uh, if, that, if it isn't, that, if it isn't a, like a, an, a gear issue, then I would look at your technique. I would film yourself, uh, like film your right hand playing and see like if you do something completely different like on the E and, e, e and D string. So for example, you might be like playing like this if you check out my, my right hand. You might be doing this on the D and G, but when you get to the E, you might be doing like this or something and like doing something like that and doing something different on the E string. Because if you're, I mean, technically, if you're doing the same thing on every string and the strings are the same and the setup is nice, then you should get roughly the same volume. Uh, there's going to be tiny variations uh, across the board, like as there always is, um, but that's totally fine. But it sounds like you've got a really diff, a really like strong difference in the variation between the volume of the D and G and the E, which does make me think that yeah, it's probably a probably a gear thing. But like if it isn't, like just grab your phone, uh, just film yourself playing your right hand, just play some bass lines, just muck around for three or four minutes, and then look at it and see if there is some like big discrepancy in how you're playing the E versus how you're playing the D and G, and that can that'll that'll probably help. Um, John says a compressor can help with an uneven volume. Absolutely, compressors can help. Uh, uh, I would use uh, compressors as a kind of last step, though. I'd, I'd want to kind of make sure everything's uh, everything's good with your technique and with your gear first, and then use a compressor as like a, an additional layer of varnish rather than you know a leg on the on the table, so to speak. Because I mean, if you take a leg, if you take that leg away, that compressor, uh, and then like if it, if your compressor breaks or something, then you still have that problem. So I'd rather fix the problem at its source and then use a compressor compressor, like I said, as a nice varnish rather than a structural element. But yeah, absolutely, you can use compressors to help with that kind of stuff. Um, do you play a specific hand position to play faster? Not really. I, I pretty much always stick around. 
stick around uh, right here. Uh, if I do need to play something that uh, is a little bit faster, I will shift a little bit towards the bridge. There's more tension here, it gives a bit more resistance, so you can, you know, can get a little bit more speed through there, I've found. Uh, you might be different, uh, but yeah, just experiment a little bit and see what feels the best. Uh, but usually I'm just kind of staying like right kind of in between my pickups right there. Um, okay, sweet. Okay, so I've gone over over the 10 minutes I said we we're going to do. <laughs> but that's all good. That's totally okay. Thank you guys so much for showing up. I really appreciate it. Big hugs wherever you are in the world. I uh, hope you're staying well. Hope you're staying safe. Hope you're staying healthy. Hope you're washing your hands, doing all that kind of stuff. Hope you're not going uh, too stir crazy, being cooped up in uh, in uh, self isolation as we're calling it. But once again, I really appreciate you hanging out. We're doing another one in two days' time, so uh, hopefully I'll see you there. Have no idea what we'll talk about, uh, but we'll see. Thanks so much for showing up, guys. Really appreciate it. Have a good day or night wherever you are in the world. <laughs>